Hello everyone, I'm Quinn Michael, and welcome to the first episode of my new show. I'm calling it The Shaggy Turtle Show. Huh, that's a stupid name. It's named after you, you dummy. Oh. Anyway, I figure the best way to start off this episode, and really the entire show, is to talk about the VHS era. Or at least that's what I call it. Alright, I know you guys aren't clueless, so I won't bother explaining what a VHS tape is. On the other hand, I will waste time explaining that the VHS was made by Victor Company of Japan in the 1970s. Now, I wasn't around for that, but I am aware that VHS continued to be produced into the 2000s, and that VCRs didn't stop being made until 2016. But when I say the VHS era, I am referring to the 70s, 80s, and 90s collectively. There are many things that contributed to my love of this era I was barely even around for, and I hope I get to talk about all of them on this show someday, but I figure the best place to start would be with this. The Nintendo Entertainment System. As a kid, Nintendo was kind of like this virtual entertainment Herculean demigod. It was like, just so many childhood memories came courtesy of Nintendo, and I'm sure I'm not alone in the sentiment. Naturally, this led to me amassing a decent collection of games over the years. This is actually the same NES my dad had when he was growing up, and when I was a kid, I had an NES 2. This NES stayed at my grandparents' house, and I lost the NES 2 in a house fire years ago. Eventually, the NES wound up in my house. But it didn't work at first, all I could ever get was the dreaded flashing red light. I thought I was going to have to replace the 32-pin connector until some people online recommended I wiggle the cartridge around inside the NES to get a better connection. It took a few tries, but I finally got it working, so thanks, Internet. That said, I still have some games that don't work. Six, specifically. Blaster Master, Trog, Double Dragon 2, Legend of Zelda, Iron Sword, and the Mario Duck Hunt combo cartridge that came packed with pretty much every NES. That does make me a little sad, considering I played all these as a kid, with the exception of Blaster Master, which didn't work when I bought it. Which, you know, fun. But yeah, I've had the rest of these games pretty much my entire life. But I just can't get them working again, so we might as well move on and talk about the games I own that do work. Originally, this video was going to be, like, all of my games together in one video, but that's like 33 games or something. That's insanity. So we're going to be chopping this up into parts, and for the first part, we're going to do 12 games. So... Let's get into it. Let's start with the basics. Mario, Metroid, and Zelda. They're considered essentials for anyone interested in classic Nintendo, and for very good reason, since despite any glitches, wonky physics, or other frustrations, these games are at the top of the pile when it comes to gaming. The Mario series is undeniably classic, but my favorite in the series has to go to Super Mario Bros. 3. <laughs> I feel like this is where the series really hits its stride. The controls feel perfect, the worlds are varied, and each offer a different challenge. And the power-ups are all nothing short of iconic. You got the Fire Flower, Raccoon, Tanuki, Frog, all classic stuff. Super Mario World on Super Nintendo is a better game, I think. But Mario 3 is definitely my favorite. Metroid was the first game I played that had a truly oppressive atmosphere. Like, you felt alone on this planet. It was you and your gun versus everything, and it felt scary at times. Or at the very least, tense. You never knew if you were actually going to survive to make it back to safety. And that makes it kind of special. It also has one of the most iconic endings in video game history. I would love to talk more about this game, but I want to give it its own dedicated episode later on down the line. So we're going to move on for now. But don't you worry. We'll be coming back to this one. Metroid. Watch Zelda become a legend on your Nintendo Entertainment System. Zelda! Whew, Zelda. What can I say about Zelda? I mean, it's my favorite NES game of all... It's my favorite video game of all time. I can't put into words how this game makes me feel. It's... It's special. It's just... It's special. I mean, I don't know if I'll ever be able to explain how much this game means to me. It got into my head, my heart, my imagination, like nothing else ever had. It's the game that made me want to make video games. That's really all I can say about it. Whoa, nice graphics! A lot of people are already familiar with the Mario Duck Hunt combo cartridge, but I have the cartridge that's Super Mario Duck Hunt 
and world class crack. There's not much to say about Duck Hunt, you just point your gun at the targets and shoot them. It's pretty fun. My zapper still works too, and this sound is ingrained into my brain. As for a world class track meet, you can't play that without the power pad, and I don't have the power pad, so we can't play it. It's kind of a shame, since I do remember playing it as a kid when I was being babysat, and I recall it being pretty cool, I think. I was also a dumb kid, so I might be mistaken. Anyhow, let's move on. If we're talking about essential NES games, we have to talk about Castlevania. It's another one of my favorite NES games. While it's not made by Nintendo, it's often held in the same regard as Mario and Zelda. Admittedly, I was a big wuss as a child and refused to play anything remotely scary. I actually had a nightmare about Castlevania, although that dream owed itself more to Super Castlevania 4, but... <laughs> Thanks to that, I refused to touch Castlevania. When I finally stopped being a little pansy about it, I found one of the most finely crafted platformers I would ever play. Every encounter in this game is clearly thought out and has a solution. It's a little bit of a trial and error kind of game, but I don't see anything wrong with that. Lots of games are trial and error, and most people don't give it a second thought. And when they do, um, I'm just gonna let that situation stand for itself. Regardless of that, Castlevania's finely crafted challenge and unique horror-based style make this a must-own for any collection. Since we're already on the subject, let's talk about my other two Konami-made games. Remember when they made games? Well, here's two of them, Gradius and Life Force. These games belong to the Gradius series of side-scrolling shoot-em-ups. If you don't already like shmups, these won't convince you otherwise. But for those who are fans of the genre, you're likely already familiar with these. Gradius is a fine game and one of the early innovators in the genre, featuring a selectable power-up feature called the Weapon Bar. Certain enemies in the game leave behind an icon. Picking up one lights an option at the bottom of the screen and each subsequent icon you pick up shifts the cursor towards the right. This allows you, the player, to decide which power-up you want to use. However, once you select a power-up, the selection will reset, so you gotta be smart. My recommendation is to use a speed-up as soon as possible and then stockpile icons for the better power-ups, namely the laser, the shield, and the option, which mimics your every move. The more of these you have, the more space you can cover. Or you could cheat. Up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, be a start. Yep, we're gonna talk about the Konami code. This code was popularized by Contra. Using it in that game gave you 30 lives, making the challenge seem far more surmountable. But it actually originated in Gradius. The code was created by Kazuhisha Hashimoto, the man behind the NES port of Gradius. He found the game to be too difficult during playtesting, so he created a cheat code to give himself a full set of power-ups. He forgot to remove the code from the final version of the game, and it was discovered and spread through word of mouth, and Konami began using the code in other games. Like Life Force. Life Force, originally known in Japan as Salamander, is a spin-off follow-up sequel not really to Gradius. It's another game I played a lot as a kid. I got good enough at it that I could make it a stage 3 if I had a game over without using the 30 lives code. For someone as unskilled and uncoordinated as me, I don't think that's very bad. The arcade version of Life Force utilized a more generic power-up system than Gradius, but for the NES version, they used the Gradius weapon bar. Whether this is a good or a bad thing will depend on your tastes, but I personally prefer the NES version. That's probably just because of nostalgia. But one of the best things about Life Force in comparison to Gradius is that it supports two-player simultaneous co-op. <sighs> I was wondering if you had something for me to do this episode. Like I said before, this game also uses the Konami code. But instead of giving you a full power-up like in Gradius, it just gives all players 30 lives, like in Contra. But be warned, the code only works in the NES version. No cheating allowed on Famicom. Thanks to this, we can definitely beat the game in one sitting. But that doesn't mean it's not chaotic as heck. Right, so the story, as I understand it, is that we're fighting a massive creature named Zelos from the inside. Hence, why many of the levels have a biological theme. Brains, bones, blood cells, you get the picture. It is a pretty interesting setup for a shooter, but occasionally you just fight in a generic space setting, or this fiery corridor populated by phoenixes and dragons. Okay, that's... You seem to be forgetting that Konami is a Japanese company. 
I mean, Granny has these giant Easter Island heads that attack you, and now we're fighting a giant Zero head in space. Ugh. I need a drink. Dude, don't put it on the controller. Watch out, what are you doing? Oh, shit. Uh, sh Shaggy? 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 I'm sorry, my friend. I could not I stop Zellos. You, you must carry, carry on, on for me. For me. Remember me, Remember me as, as I was. As a drunk moron? What? No! no, no. Just, just go kick his ass. Alright, Zellos. You're going to pay for what you did to my friend. No matter the quick trench run, the game ends. This is where I will voice a small complaint. See, while the Japanese version doesn't have a cheat code, it does have a bonus ending depending on how many continues you use. If you do well enough, you get a little Metroid-style bonus. It might not be a bikini, but it doesn't really need to be. It's just a cool bonus. And on one more note, the Famicom cartridge is one of the coolest looking cartridges. To the point that I would collect it just for the coolness factor if I could. Now, let's shift gears for a second and talk about sports. I'm not a fan. When I was a kid, I didn't really get sports games. I mean, why not just go play sports? But now I think I get it. It's probably a lot of fun to imagine being part of a successful sports team, or your favorite team, or even your favorite player. But since I'm not a sports guy, I can't really say I relate. I have two sports games in my collection, RBI Baseball and the classic football game 10 Yard Fight. I don't think they're bad games. Are they good? I couldn't tell you. That might sound like a hand wave, and it is. But like I said, these aren't my kind of games. Speaking of shifting gears, does racing count as a sport? Alright then. Much like other sports games, I used to not really get racing games either. If I was going to play a sports or racing game, I wanted it to be over the top, like Arch Rivals or Mario Kart. But now that I'm older, I kinda get the appeal of driving a cool car at breakneck speeds. It might have also helped that one of my favorite shows as a child was Knight Rider. Knight Rider, a shadowy flight into the dangerous world of a man who does not exist. RC Pro-Am is a game about racing remote control cars from an overhead isometric view. It's actually a lot of fun. You can even get power-ups in between races and totally wreck your opponents. This game is made by the famous game company Rare, responsible for games like Donkey Kong Country, Banjo-Kazooie, and Conker's Bad Fur Day. As such, both RC Pro-Am and its sequel are available on the Rare Replay Collection on Xbox One. Now then, let's play some Rad Racer. Now this is what I'm talking about. This is probably the most well-known racing game on the NES, and for good reason. The game bears more than a passing resemblance to Sega's OutRun. They both even feature Ferraris. Although they are different models, and you can choose to be an F1 racing machine in Red Racer. Naturally, OutRun is the superior game. I mean, what did you expect? It's on superior hardware. Red Racer also lacks branching paths and has fewer music tracks. Actually, at first, I thought Red Racer only had one music track that played at random. But after doing Wikipedia research for this video, I discovered for the first time that you can change the track from three different ones or silence by pressing down on the control pad. I've been playing this game for almost 20 years, and I only just now figured this out. I am an idiot. All three tracks are fine, and I'd love to hear a simp style cover of some of them. But personally, I prefer to do what I do with all racing games and play the soundtrack from the fantastic 80s movie The Raid. Or as I like to call it, 10 terrific tracks that will get you a speeding ticket.
Rad Racer was created by a company you may have heard of called Square. According to Wikipedia, the main reason for the development of the game was that Square owner, Masafumi Miyamoto, wanted to demonstrate programmer, and I'm going to butcher this name, I'm sorry, Nasir Gabelli's 3D programming techniques. Speaking of 3D, if you have a pair of 3D glasses laying around, you can press select to activate a 3D mode. I do not have 3D glasses, so this is entirely pointless. It was also directed and supervised by Hironobu Sakaguchi, and the music was created by Nobuo Uematsu. This was the last game the company released in America before all three of these guys moved on to another great game I have to own. Final Fantasy. What can I say about this series? Created as Square's last ditch attempt at a breakout hit, the game passed with flying colors and created a mega franchise that continues to this very day. Like many gamers, I was introduced to the series with Final Fantasy VII, except I was a baby when that game came out and I practically grew up with it alongside Legend of Dragoon, Ape Escape, and the NES. Naturally, I played the other games in the franchise as I was growing up, including my personal favorite, Final Fantasy IV, but the original Nintendo release always evaded me until a few years ago. The game's dated, really dated, but it's still pretty good. Still, I wouldn't recommend this as your first Final Fantasy. But if you're a fan of classic turn-based RPGs and you somehow haven't played this one yet, you should at least give it a try. There is so much in this game that it deserves its own video someday. But unfortunately for this video, we're out of time. Tune in next time when we talk about some arcade type games and some of those black tangent cards. There's some pretty interesting history there. But, until next time, I'm your host, Quinn Michael. And I'm still the ghost. And like it or not, we'll be back next time. <laughs>